Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us today to watch our clinical course taster. Uh, this is Catherine Anderson. She is one of our amazing educators here at Unite Health that would run you through a lot of our clinical content that we cover to become a clinical Pilates instructor in both your mat and equipment. My name is Laura. I'm one of the course consultants here. So if you have any questions, I'm always here to chat. Um, but Catherine, tell us a little bit about your background yeah. with APPI. Absolutely. So I am a physiotherapist uh, originally. I qualified as a physio in 2001. And that was around the time when physio was first starting to look into how we would use Pilates as an active form of rehab. I did some Pilates training in my first few years through DMA. And then a couple of years later, I was looking for further training, which is where I was exposed to APPI. So in 2006, I did my full mat work and equipment certification. And at the end of that year, I had the opportunity to become a course presenter. So I've been presenting these courses now for many years, 18, I think a long time. Yep. Um, <laughs> and around seven or eight years ago, I was made the opportunity to become the master trainer in Australia. So I'm now the APPI master trainer here and I present on these courses all the time. In today's session, we will cover a lot of what the APPI clinical Pilates course will touch on. Um, but firstly, let's start with what actually is clinical Pilates? Very good question. So clinical Pilates was derived from traditional Pilates. Joseph Pilates was a man who in the early 1900s, around 100 years ago, he developed a method that brought together lots of different techniques such as yoga and strength training and kettlebell training. He was a big studier of movement and so as he created his method, he started to create exercises and equipment that meant that people could train in the way that you now see today. Now, clinical Pilates was, is a branch of traditional Pilates that was probably started to develop around 30 years ago. Now, what we know from a clinical point of view is that when it comes to injuries such as back pain and shoulder pain, using exercises to inhibit and to encourage different muscles to work can improve people's outcome in pain. So in clinical Pilates, what we do is we take concepts that have been researched and found to be useful in rehabilitation and match it with Pilates exercises, which means that we're not doing exercises in a very traditional way or we're not doing them in a completely traditional way, but rather we're using those exercises to be clinically relevant and clinically helpful in that person's rehab experience. So Catherine, why would we encourage those who are working in a clinical space to come and learn clinical Pilates? Yeah, the thing about learning clinical Pilates is I see it as an extension of what you may have learned in your undergrad. And the opportunity to start melding the Pilates methods into the way that you're treating has benefits for both you and your patients. From a patient side of it, there's something really nice to be able to move from using a passive form of treatment into more of an active form of treatment. And for me, every day, I use that as a dovetail of the way that I progress my clients onto more functional things. From a therapist's point of view, training in Pilates gives you a really good opportunity to create a dynamic opportunity for your clinical work to be different. And so if you're using mostly manual therapy skills or if you're using sports rehab skills, that comes with its own environment. And particularly what we find with a lot of our physios is that after a few years, their hands tend to get tired and they tend to get sick, at looking, sick of looking at the same four walls. And so by having Pilates training as an addition to your clinical training, it then means it gives you the opportunity to not only do the work in the treatment room that you love so well and do so well, it also means you can start to run classes or you can start to do one-on-one -on -one appointments that are a hybrid combination of the opportunity to press on someone's back or to mobilise someone's back, but also then teach them an exercise that will help them to rehabilitate out of that injury. So Catherine, I'd love if you could share with us how you personally use clinical Pilates in your day-to-day -day life and your work. Yeah, I use Pilates literally every day of my practice. I'm a musculoskeletal physiotherapist and so I spend four days a week treating clinical patients and the opportunity for me to use clinical Pilates starts right from the initial assessment completely through to their end stage rehab. So for example, if I had someone on the first day that they were presenting to me with neck pain, 
included in my active and passive range of motion assessment, I'd also like to know how that person was moving their neck and, and using their neck from a day-to-day -day point of view. So there's a particular exercise in that work one that is perfect for that, and I'll always do that for my initial assessment. When the person performs that exercise, they can often give me feedback about where they feel tight or restricted, so that then forms a key part of my manual therapy. Moving to rehabilitation, I see Pilates as a really nice kind of centre point of getting people from the treatment room, having passive, passive treatment, right up to full functional rehabilitation. So Pilates gives them an opportunity to move in a really safe and supportive way uh, and start to feel activation of muscles they maybe didn't know they had uh, before. Then I use the Pilates concepts and particularly the five key elements that we'll talk about today in order to inform the way that I do their functional and higher level rehabilitation. So if I have someone who's returning to running, I use the five key elements of the rib cage and the pelvis position to ensure that when I do get them running, it means that they can use their glutes and hamstrings effectively rather than loads at their lower back. Amazing. Thank you so much, Catherine. Now, last we're on the topic of the APPI key elements, I would love if you could show us the way that these are used for the foundation of every movement that we do in APPI Pilates. Fantastic. All right, let's jump on the mat. So welcome to the Pilates five key elements. The five elements are breathing, rib cage placement, neutral spine, shoulder blade placement, and head and neck placement. And this informs every single movement that we do. Now number one, which is breathing, refers to trying to use a lateral breath. And so what that looks like is to try and get the movement into the bottom outside part of the lungs. Now a few clinical implications for this is that if you have a really good orientation of the thoracic spine, it means that the breath can easily come into the outsides of the lungs and we can get that lovely lateral breath where the big lung volume is being used. But if the thoracic spine is potentially put into a little bit of extension, which is a really common posture that you will see, you'll notice that the lateral breath is harder to access. And this leads me into the second key element, which is rib cage placement. Now what we're looking for is we're looking for a really flush position between the end of the ribs and the abdominal. So Laura, I'll just get you to place your hands on there. And I'm going to get you to look for that little step that sits between the end of your rib cage and coming into your abdominals there. So you can take a big breath in, and then as you breathe out, I just want you to drop the back of your ribs down towards the floor, like you're sinking that down. Beautiful, and you can feel that that now feels flush. Now, by bringing the rib cage in, it gives access to that lateral breath. So obviously there's clinical implications to improve people's breath patterns, improve pain in the back by using this, also to help with chronic pain by making sure they can take those beautiful big box breath that helps to inhibit things like the adrenaline response or fight or flight. Um, but the next clinical implication of having the ribs in this nice neutral position, it means that you've set the length tension of the upper abdominals so that they're re then ready to activate in your Pilates movements. Now coming on to key element number three, this is about neutral spine. Now with neutral spine, we have two parts. We have the shape that we're making in the back, and we also then have the activation. And so keeping your ribs just nicely where they are, I'm gonna get you to go through a few pelvic tilts forward and back. Now, what you'll see there is Laura can move pretty nicely through her pelvis without her rib cage moving, and that's because she's practiced in Pilates. But sometimes at this stage, we need to work a lot with patients to teach them that they can move their pelvis without moving their rib cage. Now, when you get that really nice combination of rib cage staying in and rolling forward through the pelvis, we find that we end up with the lumbar spine in a neutral lumbar lordosis. And this is a really key part of clinical Pilates as opposed to traditional Pilates, because the way that Joseph Pilates used to switch the core on was in an imprinted spine or in a flat back. So by moving more into lumbar neutral or neutral lumbar lordosis, it then means that we can exercise this person or create load into the body of this person in a neutral spine, which of course is a lot more functionally relevant than working in the imprinted spine and the flat back. So we now have the position where we have a nice neutral spine. Um, and what usually happens for a lot of people, particularly if you haven't had a history of back pain or if you've got nice range in your back, is that when you make this shape, you should feel a nice, gentle, automatic contraction of the lower abdominals. Now, if you feel this, you can do a big tick on number three and you've found neutral spine. 
But if you can't feel that automatic contraction, we can then purposefully switch on the pelvic floor or the transversus abdominis in order to make sure that the muscles are set and ready to move. So I'm just gonna put my hands on the insides of your hip bones just here. And I'm gonna get you to take a little breath in. And as you breathe out, I want you to just lift up just a tiny bit through your pelvic floor, like you're just trying to stop yourself from going to the toilet. You're not particularly hankering for that toilet, you're just a few minutes away. You just have to do a gentle contraction. Now, when Laura does that, I can feel that her pelvic floor and transversus abdominis are increasing in tone, and that makes me then know that her primary sling is, is ready to move. All right, from here, moving up to shoulder blade placement, we're best to get you up into a sitting position, if you don't mind, Laura, so just a cross-legged sitting position, side onto the camera. Now, in this position here, we're looking at the position of where the scapula attaches to the chest wall. What we really want with the scapula is a nice congruent position where the thoracic wall and the scapula are really closely together. So this is a really useful one if you have someone who say has a very winging scapula, or also if you have someone with a really rounded shoulder position. And so what we're looking for here is just a nice squareness in the shoulders. Now, particularly on equipment level two, we go more into detail with this because there are a couple of different parts of neutral scapula, not just the scapula itself, but also what the glenohumeral joint is doing. So we'll talk about that more on the actual training courses, but really we want a nice kind of um, wide position of the collarbones, which means those shoulders are ready to move. Now, here is another really key difference between traditional Pilates and clinical Pilates in that the cue that many people use for, for traditional Pilates is to press their shoulders down their back. Now, we don't use that a lot in clinical Pilates because what that then does is it uses the lats to stabilise and it drags down against the structures of the neck, the upper tracts and the levator scap. And so the other problem of it, of course, is, is that your shoulder is depressed it means that it then can't upwardly rotate when you lift your arm. So that nice suspension and balance, of course, we'll, we'll teach you the detail about this more, but that nice suspension of the shoulder being nice and square in space so that it's ready to move is what we're looking at. So that's your fourth key element there. Moving on to the fifth now, we're looking at the head and neck placement. And so with the head and neck, we've got two different planes that are, we're orientating in. The first plane is looking at the center of the ear into a midpoint of the, gleno the glenoid there. And what we're really hoping is that the center of the ear will sit over the glenoid. So the cue that I would give Laura for there is just to bring your head a little bit back horizontally so we can get those two points lined up nicely. Now the other part refers to the upper cervical spine, and this is particularly useful if you've got a client who had, has headaches or upper cervical compression. And this refers to the orientation of their forehead into their chin. And for most people, you want those two points in about the same plane as each other vertically. So once you've got that position, you're now set through your core muscles and your stabilizing muscles and you're ready to move. So now I'd like to show you some of the repertoire. The first exercise I'm going to show you is called leg pull in prone prep level one. Now that sounds like a little bit of a mouthful, but the reason why we call it that is because it's based on one of Joseph Pilates' original 34 exercises called leg pull in prone. Now this is what the original leg pull in prone exercise looks like. And the only difference between Joseph Pilates version of it and our highest APPI level of it is that instead of being in a tucked under position as per the traditional Pilates method, we would have the person in a neutral spine. Now I'm going to show you the level one version of that. So Laura, do you mind being our model? I'm going to get you on all fours in the middle of your mat. Now I use this exercise all the time because I feel like it's something that you can use whether the person is coming to you for a neck injury for a back injury or for a hip or even knee injury. And you'll see how it works in a moment. Now, getting the five key elements in four point kneeling is really important here because that gives you the opportunity for the efficacy or the effectiveness of the exercise. And so with the starting position, we're looking at those five key elements. So first of all, we'll check the person can breathe laterally. Beautiful, excellent. We'll then check that their rib cage is flush with their abdominals. Beautiful. We'll then make sure the person's in neutral lumbar spine. And it's very common for people here to want to be either anteriorly tilted or excessively posteriorly tilted and very flat back. So that beautiful neutral spine is really paramount to this exercise. 
From a scapular point of view, we want the scapula really congruent to the chest wall. So what we don't want to happen is we don't want the chest wall to dip um, because what that means is that it can't attach. We want to be strong in the arms and really press out, almost like you've got telescopic arms, and not quite so much as that, because that's a bit of thoracic kyphosis, but more imagining it comes from here. So if you lift through there, beautiful, that gets a really flush position here. Now that's a really useful correction for people who have weaning scapula, because I feel as though, as a younger physio, I was always a little bit stuck as to what to do with those weaning scapula because I was trying to cue the scapula itself. What, what I know now though, is that if we can move the thorax up to join the scapula, it means that instead of trying to use these small shoulder muscles to stabilize, we end up being able to use the larger muscles, such as even the rectus abdominis and the transversus abdominis to hold that congruency between the scap and the chest wall. Now the fifth key element is our head and neck position. And so in this, in this position, it's quite convenient that Laura's got a ponytail here. I can just lift her ponytail up a little bit to get her head up into line with her body. And then I'll say, imagine the length in the back of your neck there, Laura, like you're looking down in an invisible line between the heels of your two hands, which gets that beautiful orientation of the eyes and the opening of the upper thoracic, upper cervical spine. So from here, what the exercise is, Laura, is you're going to tuck your toes underneath you. You're going to hover your knees off the floor for just two or three moments. And then you're going to come back down again. How do you feel there? Good. Okay. Now, I'm going to get you now to keep going through the movement. I'm going to get you to hold each hover for about three breaths if you can. So that might be about 10 seconds. And we're going to talk clinically about the type of things that we see. So as Laura hovers off, the first thing that I notice is that generally she holds the load of gravity pretty well through here, but you can now see that her head has dropped back down from the line of her body. And so that tells me we probably need more cueing through the deep neck flexors and a little bit more lift though, so we're getting that lovely, so we're getting that really nice openness through through the neck. But have, let's have a rest there. Now, that's a really, really common thing you see for people with neck pain or cervical dysfunction, and it's a really, really great position to train them in. We do have another exercise on that work one that's like a precursor to this, um, and this is a really lovely way to progress it, and it's called the swan dive. Now, the second thing we're looking for is to make sure the arms can remain nice and strong as the, as the person goes to lift. Now, it's very common that people complain of sore wrists um, when getting onto all fours, and so getting stronger and lifted through here is the key to getting the weight out of the wrists. So we have some people whose wrists are very repetitively irritated and you have to go a little slower for those people. But for the majority of people, when they're on their hands, if they feel their wrist starting to load, usually it means this has dropped down. So we then want to lift this up a little bit higher. And what that will mean is the scapula stabilizers can take the load of gravity. It means the triceps can take the load of gravity. Instead of if their head is low, it means that all the load of gravity is going down through their wrists. Now from a lower back pain and middle back pain point of view, if you have that really lovely head and neck position, your thoracic spine will be working really well. From a lower back point of view, if you maintain that beautiful lumbordosis, you'll be working really nicely there. I think Laura's done a beautiful job of that. When it comes to the hips and the pelvis though, you can get a lot of information about the biomechanics of how someone works at 90 degrees of hip flexion. So we're thinking someone who has to sit, or maybe someone who sits on a, on a bicycle, um, if you need, if you have issues around there, this exercise is absolutely gold. So this time as you hover, Laura, I'm going to get you to take probably three or four breaths as you hold. Keep that nice movement up through your deep neck flexors there. Beautiful. Now as we're holding, what we want to happen is we want Laura to primarily feel her core. What often happens is people feel the front of their legs or their thighs. And so what that means is they're posteriorly tilting. So I'm going to get you just to pick up your ribcage just a little bit stick your bottom out a little bit more. So we're using the multifidus, the part of the cone contraction of the multifidus. And what that should do is draw the work out of the legs and back up into the core and teach that person how to stabilize at 90 degrees hip flexion using their core. You've done a beautiful job there, Laura. Have a little rest there. So that's the leg pull in prone exercise. I use it for many, many different clinical issues that I see, um, and I hope that that was useful for you to start to troubleshoot. Okay, so I'd like to show you one of the exercises out of, out of Equipment Level 1, which is our Lumbo Pelvic Equipment Series. I have Marissa here on the reformer, and we're going to do an exercise called Side Plie. Now, the purpose of our Side Plie is to help us get 
a really good activation of the posterior and lateral glute med and help to control the leg through flexion and extension by maintaining neutral spine. Now this becomes particularly useful for anyone who needs that motion of pushing out. So say if you're going for a running stride, we're trying to get a person to push out into extension, um, that works really, really well. And so for the starting position here, you'll see I have Marissa on her side and I have her leg at a nice horizontal position. Now naturally if she was to rest, her knee would drop down. So we're using a little bit of a movement out of mat work level one, which is called the clam, in order to bring everything up to parallel. And you can see how that would have implications for someone who has either hip pain or also patellofemoral joint pain as well. Because if they present and they're weak in their lateral glutes, they'll naturally want to move more like that, which of course is going to put load in their knee. And we're trying to encourage them to train themselves to work here, which is of course going to improve their alignment. Now, a really big one for this exercise is to make sure the person's in neutral spine and that they maintain their neutral spine because it's very common for people to want to roll backwards. And it's also really common, particularly in this really high degree or that, that low degree of hip flexion, for people to posteriorly tilt. So what I usually do is I get the person to press all the way away first. So if you press out through your foot there and just hold there for a Marissa. So now that her hip is extended, she's got a little bit more room to get her neutral spine, which just means sticking the tailbone out a little bit more. And that's going to maximise the chance of you feeling the lateral glutes. So then, as your knee bends, I want you to maintain that neutral spine, and then I'd like you to push out all the way into extension. Beautiful. Exhale to come in. Inhale to press it out. Exhale to come in. And inhale to press it out. Now, because that most common watch point is the one to posteriorly tilt as the leg comes in, the clinical implications for this is if the knee bends and the pelvis posteriorly tilts, the person's more likely to feel their anterior structures than they are the posterior ones that we're targeting. And so if you can push out to the top, holding it there, Marissa, if we can really, and sometimes you have to get your hands on and kind of manually manipulate the pelvis into maintaining neutral spine, what you then say is as the person's knee bends, I just want you to stick out your tailbone a little bit as your knee bends. So bend your knees, stick out your tailbone. It's like they're sitting into the movement. And what that sitting does is it really helps to bring on the posterior glutes. And then you can press all the way out. Beautiful. So stick your butt out a little bit on the way down. Excellent. And core strong on the way out. Now after probably eight or ten reps, most people should feel that they're, say that they're starting to feel a little bit of that posterior glute beat there. Um, and if they're not, I would be suspicious about whether they've lost some of those neutral points there. Now you do have some people that are really chronically underactive in these muscles and they need a little bit of help. So the starting point I usually use for that is to use a turnout. So it's almost like a bit of a ballet second position. You want to make sure that as well as the toe being turned out, you also want to make sure the femur is externally rotated so the knee is also tracking over that toe. So then when they go into plie, the then knee will come up and that just shortens the glute need a little bit more and it makes it more likely to activate. So you can press out there. Now clinically, this is a really great way to start to get that muscle moving. And you can see as Marissa comes in and out, you can see she's moving almost through a sumo squat motion. But unless you're a ballerina, or unless you're doing a lot of pivoting on that wide position, this is not very functional. And so in time, you really want to work that person back into straight or parallel with their legs in order to make sure they can get full use of their gluteus medius when they're doing daily tasks such as climbing stairs, walking and running. I'm going to show you an exercise which is called the Cadillac Twist with Pulses. And we're on the Cadillac here, and the exercise I've chosen is out of our Equipment 3 repertoire. And this is the, the course where we start to go into spinal articulation um, and movements into rotation. Now, we've got Marissa here who's sitting um, on the CAD, and in a moment she's going to do this exercise which gives us two main things. First of all, it gives activation of the abdominals, then moving into the obliques. And then the second thing it gives is while the abdominals is on, it gives an opportunity to uh, increase the range of thoracic rotation. So inhale to prepare there, Marissa, and as you exhale, I want you to stack this hand on top of this one. Inhale again, 
And as you exhale, want you to go belly button to spine. So this is a very pure posterior tilt. Now what you'll notice is a lot of people want to do what Maurice has done there, which is round their head, neck and shoulders. So come back up to the top. And I want you to stay really square and tall here. And I just want you to move from your belly button there. That's perfect. Now as you roll down, it's almost like you're trying to do an upside down roller door. So this bit's going to work first. And you're going to come all the way back down to what I call the sweet spot. And that's the spot where you just feel your abdominals start to work. Then the second part of the exercise is to take this hand off the bar, you watch it so that your nose and your thumb stay aligned, and then you're opening that arm as far as you feel comfortable. And then once you've got that beautiful alignment between nose and thumb, you're then looking for three pulses through the chest. So for three, two, and one. Beautiful, and you can come all the way back up to the center. Now once your hand reaches the bar, you then want to think nose forward first. So round through your back a little bit, bring your nose forward, and then you sit up through the tailbone to come back to the middle. Now we have to do a couple more of those. So I'll talk through major watch points. As the person rolls down, if they can't get that really pure posterior pelvic tilt coming from the rectus abdominis, what you will see is that they will start to use their hip flexors instead. So I'm constantly asking my clients in this exercise, what are you feeling? And they need to be saying it's here rather than down into their hips. Second major watch point is people often want to bend this standing arm or this holding arm. And the reason for that is because they trust their biceps more than they trust their abs. Now, third watch point is that as they move into the twist, what you really commonly see is we have people wanting to move through their arm, but not necessarily through their head. So you'll see their eyes stay back there and they end up waving their arm around in space here, which doesn't actually produce an oblique contraction. So trying to make sure that their head stays over their arm and then they turn from their chest means that you get that beautiful thoracic rotation, which is going to facilitate obliques more specifically. Beautiful. And then finally, as the person comes forward again and they start to roll up, to be in this long sitting position with legs extended, it requires a little bit of hamstring length. And so if the person doesn't have the hamstring length, I'd rather they bend their knees a little to be able to get that active pull back up into neutral spine, which gives them all that lovely multifidus control that they need from here, rather than to end the exercise with straight legs and with a posterior pelvic tilt. So I find this exercise really useful for anyone who wants to work their abdominals a little bit more. Anyone who wants abdominals at the same time as rotation, so functionally it might be someone like a tennis player or someone who moves side to side in that plane for their sport. Um, and it's also just really fun. So I hope you enjoyed that exercise and I hope you find it as useful as I do. What I'm gonna do today is to demonstrate the port de bras exercise to you. And I find this is a really useful one, particularly for people with stiffness in their upper thoracic spine and people who find it really hard to get deep neck flexor strength against gravity. So we have Marissa here who's going to do the exercise for us. And Marissa, if you don't mind, I'll get you to extend your arms out in front and I'll get you then to bring your chin to chest and sit all the way up, so sit tall. Beautiful, so this is the starting point of the port de bras. Now from here, we're going to use your lower core to tuck your tailbone under and you'll feel you're basically trying to put each individual vertebrae back onto the barrel. Now as you start to get to this midpoint, your shoulders will, your hands will come up over your shoulders and you'll extend all the way back. And once you feel like you're through your range, you'll then circle your hands wide and then once your hands come to centre, bring chin to chest to come all the way back up. Now as we sit up, we're trying to kick our tailbone back so we sit nice and tall and use those beautiful multifidus muscles. So exhale to roll back. Inhale to circle. And then exhale to roll back up. Beautiful, how's that feeling? Yeah, great. Lovely. Now as we move through the movement here, I'm going to show you some of the major watch points. So I'm going to get you just to pause there. I know there's a bit of abdominal work there, so you'll have to show us your strong abs. Now at this point here, Marissa's got beautiful mobilisation or beautiful range through her upper thoracic spine, but many people do not. So they get to this point there and their upper thoracic gets stuck. And because it won't roll back, they try and do the movement with their head instead. And we certainly don't want that flipped off head because that hyperextension or that excessive neck extension of the neck is going to make the neck get sore. So what we do in this situation is we take one hand, we put it behind the head, and we use that hand a little bit like a traction to keep length through the neck. And that helps to mean, or just the one hand if you don't mind, and that helps to mean that as they then go back through the movement, 
that head is supported and they can find a point of the movement. Even if the head doesn't make it back to the barrel, their head is still supported when they do their nice big arm circle. Now, this is another part of the movement that we want to watch for. So if you hold there, again, I'm making you work your abs here as we pause the exercise. What we want people to do is we don't want them to move their head until their arms are almost back by their side and it then becomes an abdo prep, which is out of our mat work level one. Now from here, we want to make sure that rather than coming up with their chin poking out and forward, we want to try and make sure that their back and their neck stays long and they really shorten their deep neck flexors. And what that will do, it will mean that they can get segmental flexion so that as they then come up, you can bring your arm back there, as they then come up, they can then get a really nice position there. Now one other lovely part, you can take your hand from behind your head here, one other lovely part of this exercise is to be able to come to the top and lift your hands really tall and as you lift your hands tall you really stick your tailbone out to try and get that beautiful vertical height. Um, and that's the kind of movement that I think yoga does really well. And I think the idea of getting those beautiful arms up or the thoracic is extending is a really great way to help improve neck and shoulder pain. I have a case study that I'd like to present to you that helps to demonstrate the use of APPI and Pilates in your everyday clinic work. So this particular client who I'm going to present to you is a client who is 42 years old and around 10 years ago fell off a horse and fractured her vertebrae at her T10, 11, 12 levels. Now, in the accident, there was no neural compression, so she wasn't to become paraplegic, um, she had the fracture, the fracture was relatively stable and she was treated in a limited motion brace and on bed rest for 12 weeks. In the following years, she'd tried a number of different methods to try and improve her quality of life and in her words, she said she was on the pathway to total and full body disablement. Now this person is uh, quite um, busy in their normal active life, um, they really enjoy exercise, they've got a great relationship or had a great relationship with exercise um, and they're also a professor of law and so the idea of that person uh, being almost at full disability um, is pretty significant when it comes to the impact on not only her life but also the ripple effects through our community as well. Now, in the five years from her accident up until when I first met her, she'd tried strength training and she'd also tried Pilates of the traditional fitness variety, but she found that nothing improved her back pain. Now, you'll see that we're displaying a body chart that shows you the pains that she had when she first came in to see me. And you'll see that that pain is very widely distributed. So in addition to the localised pain around the level of her fracture, she also got a significant achiness right throughout the upper quarter, so right out into her shoulders um, and right through the thoracic spine. As well as postural achiness in that region, she had a burning sensation through her middle back. It was kind of the way she described it, it was a very nervy sensation. She also had upper trap pain, um, and then coming up into the neck, she also had um, upper cervical pain, which was referring to her eyes creating cervicogenic headaches. Now in the lower back, she had a generalised lower back pain, and then she also uh, had a generalised tightness down the back of her legs through her hamstrings. So I suppose the first reason why I've chosen to use this case is because sometimes if you see a body chart like that, it ends up becoming a little bit scary. You think, oh my goodness, where do I start? And the tricky thing is if you're going to treat this person with manual therapy, you only have so much time in a session to be able to press all the different bits where she's complaining of pain. The lovely thing about Pilates is, is it's a full body exercise, which then helps her to explore the different relationships with the different pain. Now, to begin with, where I started was I thought that trying to get some more movement through this general upper spine area was going to be really helpful. So I used some exercises from mat work level two, such as a roll down and even coming into like a yoga angry cat to try and get movement through there. Now, the reason why I chose that movement to show flexion to begin with is because flexion would create a little bit of neural flossing through her mid thoracic spine, and that worked really nicely to ease up some of her pain and the postural fatigue that she was mentioning. Now, the other part as well on her objective assessment is she had virtually zero rotation 
her thoracic spine either or in either direction. Now what I found was that when I assessed her, she had quite a significant rib flare. So if you imagine the clinical implications of that rib flare is that if the ribs are sitting forward, the lower thoracic spine is compressed. If she's recovering and, or has recovered from a fracture in that region and the position that a rib cage is in is compressing that area more, you can see how this can then result in chronic pain. And so by teaching her the second thing of the key elements, which is rib cage placement and teaching her to bring her ribs in, this then meant that she was able to open more through the back of her spine. She was able to get some flexion through those segments that were otherwise being compressed. And she was then able to open up her ribs enough to start getting a lateral breath, which meant that her costo vertebral joints and her costo transverse joints would start to mobilise. This did a really great job of melting away a lot of that kind of localised pain around the fracture site. And we decided to take that concept of flexion and opening a little further by using a shoulder bridge out of that work level one, just to get segmental motion of her spine. Now, because of the long-term stiffness that she had in her thoracic spine, her upper half was very rounded, and I think this contributed a lot to the cervicogenic headache she was experiencing. Now, of all of her different pains, this was one of the most significant that had an impact on her ability to work, because it meant she could only work for 45 minutes or so before these headaches came on. What we started to use was we got into some of the equipment level two repertoire in order to try and get movement and strength in the ability to hold. So we ended up using exercises in four point kneeling. Um, and we also then, once we had that really good strength and position, we then started to do movements on the reformer where we were strengthening up the shoulders just to improve her ability to hold herself up during the day. As a result of that, her ability to work stretched out from 30 to 40 minutes, right up to three or four hours, um, and the postural strength made an enormous difference. For many years, she hadn't really been able to exercise properly, and one of the goals she came to me with was the ability to be able to start running again. What we did find was that if she was to try and run at this stage of her rehabilitation, she'd end up with quite, un quite an uncomfortable back, and she'd also find that her hip flexors would get unbearably tight to the point where sitting at her desk was quite uncomfortable. What we then used was a lot of the repertoire out of equipment level one to start to get her, her lumbar pelvic control improved. Things like our foot series on the reformer was really good. Things like our lift and lower feeding straps on the Cadillac was really good. And we also started to use some of the swimming exercises on the barrel in order to get more extension and disassociation of the hip to help the glute max to strengthen while the lumbar spine was, was relatively relaxed. The barrel was a really good position to do that because if we tried swimming on the floor, um, lying on her tummy, she would kick into her lumbar and thoracic erectus, uh, lower thoracic erectus straight away. Now once we've used the equipment level two work to start to improve that disassociation, it was then time to try and match up her Pilates with her functional goal of running. And so we used very specific Pilates exercises to help that, such as side plie on the reformer. And we also then used the standing leg press on the chair so that we could get her getting strong in the standing side while moving and pumping her, um, her, her moving side. What, meant, what happened as a result of that is she ended up feeling more and more comfortable in her running. We started off very slow um, and we built her up step by step. So, you know, we started off with 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off for a kilometre. And then we just built progressively using the principles of adaptation from there. We're now at the point where this person has graduated, you might say, from clinical Pilates. And she now um, lives a really full life where she works full time once again and she attends multiple uh, body pump classes um, every week and runs a couple of times a week as well. She's been a convert to yoga because yoga has been a really great way to keep the mobilization through a neural system that helps to keep this area fairly pain free. Um, and everything she does, whether it be running, whether it be yoga, whether it be sitting at her desk, she uses the concepts of clinical Pilates to help to maintain her being pain free. So even though she's now not using clinical Pilates, Clinical Pilates, or in, in the method itself, clinical Pilates has become the really beautiful gateway for her to be able to do what she wants with her body. So that's a lovely success story, uh, and uh, I hope to speaking through the case area by area is helpful. Um, and uh, I feel really excited and just really proud of, um, of what she's managed to achieve through the method.
Thank you so much for joining us today for our APPI Clinical Pilates Mat and Equipment Course Taster. So just to go into a little bit more detail about what we provide you in the course, it is 14 days of training. So we do six days focused on our mat work and there's eight days focused on our equipment. Now generally all states we provide the mat work sessions online via Zoom and your equipment sessions will be in person in your state. Throughout these 14 days of training with your mat and equipment, you will learn over 250 clinical Pilates movements on the mat, reformer, cadillac, split pedal chair, and the arc barrel. Now you might be wondering how to fit all of this in with your busy schedule. The great thing is that our clinical training is really flexible. As soon as you've completed mat work level one, you can then jump into any of the other levels in any order that it suits. Although it's recommended to do it in order, it does give you that ability, freedom, flexibility to choose the dates that work for you. And we generally run these courses over a Saturday and Sunday, so it won't interfere with your weekly schedule. Now, all students will have two years to complete those levels and certification assessments as well. So you can really space them out over that period of time if that works best for you, or book in for all of the dates available now to get your certification done within the same year. For those of you living internationally, or maybe you're just hoping to get your certification done a lot faster, we do offer a eight day equipment intensive here in Melbourne, so you can come through and really get all of those levels done in one go. Now, the only requirement of you is just to do that mat work level one first. So if there's not a session running before your equipment dates, let us know and we can get that arranged for you with some recordings so you can dive straight into your equipment training. So today we have been focusing on the APPI Clinical Pilates Mat Work and Equipment Certification. Now if 14 days of training is just too long for you or two years seems like a really long time to spread out your course days, we do offer these certifications separately as Mat Work Levels 1, 2 and 3 and Equipment Levels 1, 2, 3 and 4. Then alongside that if you were looking to spread them out even further or only chip away a little bit at a time or maybe you've got an annual CPD budget that you're trying to stick to, you can also complete those levels individually. So get in touch with the team and we can chat through your options to find out what's best suited for you. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us today and learned all about the APPI Clinical Pilates Methods. We can't wait to see you on a certification with us soon. And thank you so much, Catherine, for coming in today and sharing all your amazing knowledge with us. You're welcome.